Good afternoon. I'm Mark Mulder. I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs here at the Zuckelman Holocaust Center. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's program, Cartoons as Commentary, reflecting on the art of Eric Lichtblau Leskley. It has been such an honor for the center to host the To Paint is to Live exhibit since last June. Showcasing 134 pieces of artwork, this particular exhibit is one of the largest collections of Leskley's works ever exhibited at one time. We thank the Holocaust Museum LA for loaning us this very impactful collection. We are grateful to presenting exhibit sponsor Beverly and Robert C. Rosenfeld, exhibit sponsors Robin and Leo Eisenberg, Rosie and Bernie Friedman, the Karp family, Jackie and Larry Kraft, Michael Leibowitz, the Michigan Arts and Culture Council, and the National Endowments of the Arts for their generous support and bringing this incredibly moving exhibit to Michigan. I would also like to thank our museum members and donors. Your generosity allows us to host programs like this free of charge. And we are so grateful for your support. To learn more about membership or to make a donation, please visit the front desk after the program. Through the lessons of the Holocaust, the Zuckerman Holocaust Center teaches people that the choices they make have an impact and empowers them to choose to do good and to stand up against hate. As demonstrated by Leskley's work, standing up to hatred can come in many forms, including artistic expression. Art is transcendent and it has an immortalizing power it expresses grief, pain, solidarity, and it can also be a powerful form of resistance and documentation. I have the pleasure of introducing this afternoon's speaker, Phil Hans. Phil is a political cartoonist, and we invited him in part because of his regard for Leskley's work. He responds to current political and social issues, and today you'll see examples directed at both sides of the political aisle. Phil is a Metro Detroit area native, though he doesn't live here anymore, and he began his career drawing political cartoons for the Gross Point News while he was still in high school. He is now the award-winning editorial cartoonist for the Wisconsin State Journal. Phil's cartoons have appeared in USA Today, Newsweek, Time, and the Washington Post. After Phil's presentation, we will have a brief discussion and take audience questions. Please join me in welcoming Phil Hans. Thank you very much. Hi, can you all hear me okay? Excellent, good. So as they said, I am Phil Hands. I am the political cartoonist for the Wisconsin State Journal in beautiful Madison, Wisconsin, where we got eight inches of snow yesterday. It was weird. <laughs> it is like beautiful here today. Um, so I am here to talk to you about an amazing artist, Eric Licklau Leslie, who did amazing work and under horrible circumstances that I just can't even fathom. But first, just a little bit about who this guy is. Um, he was a, uh, a Czech Jew, um, and he lived in, uh, uh, he was from Moravia, part of Czechoslovakia, uh, fled to Prague after the, the Nazis started to invade the country, and, but was unfortunately eventually deported to the Theresienstadt concentration camp slash ghetto. Um, and there, uh, he drew these amazing works of art, uh, clandestinely without people, <laughs> because uh, it was, he wasn't allowed to be drawing in the camp. There were other artists who were drawing, but he was not a sanctioned artist, I don't think. Um, and he drew these amazing works of art. Some of them are just, uh, as you saw, some of them are just sort of like what you might see out your window. Uh, these are the ramparts of the camp. Uh, just a very sort of straightforward narrative artistic expression. Uh, others are much more cartoonish. Uh, these are clearly six individuals uh, from a bunk in one of the barracks. Uh, so he is, uh, he's capturing their likeness. Um, he's also, uh, I think these are generally sympathetic drawings of these people, um, but this is just sort of a, a, a sort of a cartoon illustration. There isn't a strong message uh, behind it, uh, but he's got uh, a lot of images with some serious punch. Um, as I sort of mentioned, so Theresienstadt was different than a lot of concentration camps. I hate to use the term privileged concentration camp, but it's, it's, it's where a lot of the higher society uh, people were deported to. Um, and there were artists there, writers, playwrights, um, 
And, and several of those artists who were actually, I believe, commissioned to do some work uh, to sort of as propaganda for the camp, were, were they, they were also doing work uh, that was not so sympathetic, of, of, or it was not so propaganda-ish and showed the horrors of camp life, and they were uh, found out and deported. And when that happened, Leslie understandably started cutting up his work and hiding it, and his wife hid uh, the, all of his drawings underneath the floorboards of her barracks, supposedly. And, and so he, th you can see where this, this image is cut up. Um, and uh, th this is an image from uh, a, a drawing that was done in the camp. Later, after the war, his wife was able to recover the, the images. And when he, after he moved to Israel, uh, he created these watercolor paintings, which you saw in the gallery out there. And actually, I had just saw them for the first time in person. I'd never seen the work in person before. And wow, is it breathtaking. It is something else. Um, but he's created these, these images uh, in Israel. And for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to mostly show these images because these are sort of the complete cartoons. Um, and, and so this one is, is, is pointing out sort of, he's got a great sense of pointing out the absurdity and the irony in the camps. This is the uh, order police, which was a, a Jewish guard who was in charge of doling out rations to people. And he's telling the people looking for their, uh, for their rations, uh, please don't push. And of course, as he's doing this, he's pushing the people back. And this is the kind of work that Leslie's always doing, where he's pointing out the absurdity and the ironies in the camp. Um, and that a lot of the work is very sort of just biographical. This is uh, an image of him in his fir the first night in the ghetto. Um, and he's, he had a fever and was forced to sleep on the floor. He told the doctor that he wasn't feeling, feeling well and he needed a place to stay and to sleep. And the doctor said he didn't have enough vitamin P, which was short for privilege. Uh, and so one of the things that Leslie's always doing in his work is he's commenting on this social structure and the hierarchies that exist within the camps, which is something I don't think a lot of us really ever think about. Um, we don't think about what life was actually like for the people living there and, and the fights they would have. The doctor here is, I believe, uh, a Jewish doctor who's, a mem who's st in the camp as well. Um, and he, this doctor appears repeatedly in these cartoons. I don't think Leslie liked him very much. Um, uh, there's some not so great images of him. Um, but he is very sympathetic to a lot of the inmates, obviously. Um, uh, this is an older woman. He's especially sympathetic to the older and sicker people in the camps uh, because they often are getting less food and they have these, they're, they're ill and they have these dire circumstances that they're living in. And this is an older woman and she's trading her warm sweater for half a loaf of bread. Um, and, and just what a heartbreaking uh, concept that that is. And I, I believe those three, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe those three dots on the armband mean that this person is blind and that these people show up several times, or hard of seeing, and so they show up several times in these images. Um, he also documents uh, the illnesses that run rampant through the camp. This is the Terran Zika, and I, this guy is, uh, I think he has tissue paper and he's running to the bathroom as fast as he can. Um, which, which sounds unpleasant. Uh, and this is encephalitis in the, in the ghetto, uh, which, which, I mean, if this wasn't, uh, this, somebody said this looked like an ad for the disease, that <laughs> it's like, try encephalitis, you know, but it, it's a beautiful image. Um, and just, I mean, if you saw this without the context, you would say, that's a, that's a cartoon. That looks like a political cartoon. It, it does to me, absolutely. Um, and then some of his work gets even more I would say, into the realm of a political cartoon. Um, as he's, he's sort of comparing and contrasting what's going on with these, Ill, these inmates in the, in the camp. So this is prisoner's disease, and he's in the, in the first of all, I'll explain. Um, I took German for way too long. I took German in, in high school and college, and I've forgotten almost all of it. So these, a lot of these translations might not be perfect, and I'm using Google Translate sometimes to figure out what's going on, but I believe this is, uh, this is the prisoner's disease was the title of this one, and uh, he's losing weight uh, because of hunger in the ghetto, and she's gaining weight because her glands are diseased in the ghetto. So, so they're both experiencing illnesses in the ghetto and having different results. And comparing and contrasting is something that political cartoonists do all the time. I think that's one of my, the biggest things that I do as a cartoonist who works in the editorial field is I'm com comparing and contrasting what I see in the news every day. Um, like, 
like the silos and the bubbles that we live in, in, in our political realm. So this is one of my political cartoons, and this is about our, our, our personal bubbles, and we have my young progressive person on the right, or the left, over there. Yeah, left, that always makes sense. And she's saying, uh, I don't know anyone who voted for Trump. I can't believe he got that many votes. And then we have my conservative person on the right saying, I don't know anyone who voted for Biden. I can't believe he got that many votes. So I'm always trying to find ways to compare and contrast what's going on in society. And we'll see that uh, throughout Leslie's work. Um, and I'm gonna argue that in a lot of ways, he is an editorial cartoonist. Now, when you think of editorial cartoons, you probably think of the things that I do, which is a lot of donkeys and elephants doing things. Um, this, is the, this is the Democratic donkey flipping a coin, and the Republican says, heads I win, tails it's rigged. Um, and I love the donkeys and the elephants because if you, if you go to like a, a national convention, a Democratic national convention, they'll have lo donkeys on logos, and, and if you go to a Republican convention, they'll have their elephants on the logos, and these were symbols that were created by cartoonists over 100 years ago to identify these two political parties. And it's one of the most long-lasting effects that political cartooning has had on America is the party uh, mascot. So I'm very proud of them. There are some people that don't like the donkeys and the elephants, but I think they're fun to draw. Um, and when you think of political cartoons, you probably also think of drawings of presidents, and I've drawn a lot of them over the years. Uh, this is a cartoon I did right after Biden was elected president. It's a brief history of executive orders, and depending on which parties, you have George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden, and depending on who's in power, the various parties uh, either love or hate the executive orders. Uh, so yes, uh, Leslie's not drawing a lot of politicians in his work, but, but I do. Uh, so I draw this guy a lot in my cartoons. Uh, do you guys know who this guy is? <laughs> yeah, except in my cartoons, he's going to look a little bit more like this. He's got that thousand watt smile. I'm sure he's had a lot of dental work done over the years. Sometimes he looks really cool, you know, with his sunglasses. I got my, I got my aviators too, just so I can be by if I want to. Uh, I also draw, I drew a lot of cartoons about this guy. He used to have a reality TV show, um, uh, except in my cartoons, he's going to look more like this, a little, little stretched out a little bit. And I'm going to argue there, there are three key aspects of any political cartoon, and, uh, and Leslie does all of them with his artwork. So first of all, it's got to have compelling artwork. I mean, that's what makes a cartoon different than anything else, is the, is the amazing visual that you see. And you want to talk about compelling artwork? I mean, look at what Leslie's doing here, this massive humanity that he's drawn, where it feels like you're in this crowd. And this is titled, uh, You Shall Be Counted, Children and the Elderly First. Um, and it's people being funneled into the camp. But it feels like you're in the crowd. I just love the way this is drawn. And compelling artwork, yeah, box checked. Um, the other thing that political cartoons don't always have, but I think it always helps if they do, is a sense of humor to them. And are you, are you saying there's gonna be funny drawings from a concentration camp? Yes, I am. Leslie was doing funny, funny drawings. And this is just a funny piece of art. It's absurd. It's, uh, it's in, in the, in the Triesenstad camp, they were put on plays, and there would be these elderly people dancing and acting on stage. And Leslie's pointing out the absolute absurdity of this. And this is the ghetto girl, an operetta in three acts. Dear little ghetto girl, give me a little love. Um, and so yeah, humorous? Yes, I think so. Um, but the most important thing that a political cartoon has, or an editorial cartoon would have, and I use the term political and editorial Inter interchangeably too much, but he's definitely, he's not drawing about political figures, Lesky. He's commenting on the world around him, which is definitely what editorial cartooning is. But it has a strong opinion. There is a misconception that what I do as an editorial cartoonist is, oh, Phil just draws funny pictures about the news. And occasionally that's what I do, but that's not always, that's not the main point. The main point is to have a strong point of view. And you want to talk about a strong point of view? Leslie's got that covered. So here's a, uh, the drawing, the, the title of this is The Anti-Semitic Jews in the Ghetto, and it's a, it's a Jew who's fouling his own nest, um, and, and, and just there, there were people in the ghetto who were ratting out their fellow cellmates and inmates and, and causing havoc, uh, or, and, 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 and creating an unsafe environment for everybody, and, and this is them messing up the nest. And this is the, uh, that's a horrible reproduction of it, but that's the, that's the uh, version from 
uh, the Israeli version. But I find this just really compelling, uh, th this version from, that he drew in the camp. He drew that in a camp. I just can't, that still boggles my mind, that artwork that he was doing at that time. But um, one thing that I find, uh, I, f I feel like I'm a, a kindred spirit with Leslie in some ways. I mean, I, I, have had so, I haven't had any of the struggles that he's had. But one of the things that is true about my work is that I can't, everything I draw is funny. And everything that he draws is sort of funny too. Like he has a whimsical way of drawing. And even the most dark subject matter that he's, that he's, that he's depicting, it, it comes off as whimsical. And this is, it doesn't get any darker than this. This is grandma's organizing her hand luggage for her trip to the east, which means going to a, a death camp to the east. But the, you know, the, the idea that she's, carefully organizing all of her luggage, and, and the way it's drawn is it belies how biting the message is because it looks fun and whimsical. Um, and this, this, there's some history behind this too that you know these people had been deported from camp to camp and, and, and they trying to, you know, they've lost most of their possessions and trying to just collect every last piece, piece of possessions that they have and trying to organize it all. And then to know that in the end, you know, what the final destination was is, is very sad and poignant. Um, and now I, I'm gonna change gears just a little bit and just tell you a little bit about who I am as a political cartoonist since when I, when I meet somebody, I wanna know who they are and why are they talking about this? Because you understand where somebody's coming from, you understand the work a little bit better and there's no better way to to meet me than to show you some of my cartoons. I grew up in the Detroit area. I'm still a loyal Tigers fan. So yay, spring training. Uh, go, go Tigers. Uh, but I work at the Wisconsin State Journal in Madison, which means I'm required to do a lot of work. I, I draw at least one cartoon about cheese a month. Uh, no, that's not actually true, but it feels like it. So I did this cartoon uh, back in 2016. It appeared in USA Today, and it was about which candidate for president was the cheesiest that year. And there was Hillary Clinton. She was like cheddar, familiar and bland, but not that bad. Bernie Sanders was like Brie, a little too European for the American palate. John Kasich was like mozzarella, too soft for the mild flavor that doesn't inspire the base. Ted Cruz was like Lindberger, stinky and offensive, but better than the alternative, which was the processed cheese food product, best to leave it in the plastic wrapper. And the hat says, make American cheese great again. I got paid for that, right? I mean, can you believe that? Uh, yeah, I like that cartoon. Um, but anyway, uh, and so when Trump became president, I, I've drawn every president that there's been since I was, a, since I think, I was drawing uh, cartoons about Bill Clinton. But when I started drawing cartoons about Trump, there's a, he, Trump brought people into the political sphere in a, in a good way that hadn't been involved in politics before and had never seen a political cartoon mocking their president. Um, and so I would get a lot of pushback from people about the work I was doing criticizing Trump which is just my job. And I would get people saying, stop disrespecting the office of the president. And I would say, I'll stop when he stops. Um, and this is, I, I like this image because this is my drawing table at the, at the newsroom and how comfortable it is compared to the situation that Leslie was drawing in. I mean, I can't imagine what he was doing. And I have this nice cushy desk. And if you look very closely, you can just barely see my kids on the wall behind me. I'm, I'm a full-time cartoonist, but I'm also a full-time dad. I love my kids, and they occasionally show up in my cartoons. I did this cartoon after the shooting in Uvalde, Texas, and it's, uh, it's my hugging my daughter saying, Dad, I'm just going to school. Um, and, and so, and so that was, that's my daughter, and it's very emotional. And of course, we've had to deal with shootings in Michigan, too. This was the Mich this Michigan State shooting. Uh, I'm majoring in molecular biology with a minor in sheltering in place, um, which I thought was a poignant message. But a lot of what I do is, pol is blatantly political and, and drawing figures. I did this cartoon in the 2020 election as a try to explain to progressives why they should support Joe Biden and not sit out the election. So the cons about Joe Biden are he's not liberal enough, he's not a fan of Medicare for all, he's not a fan of free tuition, he's not a pacifist, he's not woke, he's not articulate, he's not coherent, he's not an outsider, he's not a woman, he's not a person of color, he's not young, and he's not respectful of other women's personal space. The he's not Trump. Um, 
And then, uh, but I, I, I'm very critical of Joe Biden when he deserves it. I was a, opposed to the pullout of, of Afghanistan, and, and I imagine these young girls abandoned there who have had their education stunted by the Taliban, and Joe Biden saying, sorry, you're just not a vital national security concern. Um, you know, and so Joe Biden makes mistakes. I make mistakes too. Um, so as, a, as I, I moved to Wisconsin, it's state law that I uh, become a Packer fan. Uh, so I am. Uh, and I did this cartoon at the, at the end of this year. Uh, the Packers had a, were having an up and down season. They needed to win one more game to get to the playoffs. They had to beat the cowardly Detroit Lions. All they, all they had to do was beat the Detroit Lions, and they couldn't. So I did this cartoon the day they lost that game, before they lost that game. I was wrong. It's OK. Um, but a lot of what I'm doing as a cartoonist is I'm just commenting on the world around me. Um, the world I live in is, 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 is cold in Madison, but it's, it's my world. And that's what a lot of editorial cartooning is, just looking at the world and taking notes and finding the humor and absurdity in it. So in Madison, uh, when it hits like 15 degrees, you'll see people in shorts and t-shirts and sandals. And so, well, it looks like it cracked double digits today. And that's the, what shocked me about moving to Wisconsin from Detroit the most was just how cold, how much colder it is there. Like it's not like Detroit's warm in the wintertime, but we get weeks of sub-zero temperatures in Madison and freezes. But so while I'm commenting on my world around me, that's exactly what Leslie was doing, except his world was a lot darker. Um, but he's finding the irony and the absurdity in it. So this cartoon is that from his work is entitled uh, Exclusion from Transport to the East. Yes, Scarlet Fever comes at the right time. And so here's a person who was supposed to be on a train to the East, but unfortunately, or fortunately, they're too sick to travel. And here is this absurd image of that. And the compassion on that image is telling and the message is poignant. Um, and it's clearly a cartoon mocking the absurdity of a situation. And here's another one in that, in that similar vein. Um, uh, Farewell until we meet again in the mass grave, says the sick person to the person being deported. And if you, if you didn't know, so wh what you'll find is that this is the original of that from, from from the camp, and you know, this doesn't look like a, the, the words are so key to making this a cartoon, you know, to, to adding that punch, because other than, if you, without the words, this is just, oh, a friendly image of two guys talking to each other, but his, his way with words and the punch that he uses juxtaposed with these sort of almost silly, goofy images is really, I think, what the magic of Leslie is and why it's so important and so telling. Um, that we know, understand, and appreciate his work. Um, one thing he does a lot of is criticize other people in the ghetto, uh, and especially people who are abusing their power. Um, various people had were, were higher up in the social ladder and would use that social status to 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 cause havoc. So this is the I imagine there were room elders in each of the bunks, and the and the room elders uh, are are mean thieves. So the people who are supposed to be looking after people and stealing food are especially especially mean in this image. Um, what I also learned from studying his work is is that there was people knew what was going on in the camp. So this is rumors from the front, and and so I love the way this is drawn with just the people's heads. Uh, all, all excited to hear the latest news from what's going on with the war. Um, and the idea that there was information being shared um, was a new idea to me that I hadn't quite realized was going on, but clearly it was. Um, and then here's another uh, place where rumors were often shared, which is in Latrine B for uh, people using the bathroom and talking about what's going on on the front lines of the war. And I, I do love the sign in the, in the background, which says, Nach dem Kaken vor den Essen hände wasche nicht vergessen, which means uh, after you've used the bathroom and before you eat, don't forget to wash your hands. We ought to add that to every elementary school in America. Um, and then here's another bit of, of irony that, that he's pointing out in the, so this is the coffin factory uh, where you can get the best wood for burning. So they had a, a coffin factory on the site there, and, and the scraps of wood were the best for, for building a fire in your barracks, which 
Hopefully, if you could build a fire, maybe you would, wouldn't freeze to death and end up needing the coffin factory. Um, just the, the, the bitter circular irony that he's, that he's pointing out in all of these images is, is startling and stark. Um, he, he also sort of documents some historical events. This is uh, uh, the, the, the Danish Jews being de deported to Theresienstadt. Of course, he calls it Theresienbad, which I believe is a pun on spa. So basically, he's making it sound like it's a spa uh, to, for people, which it was not. Um, and those Danes are really kind of short and stumpy, aren't they? And very, very dark, very black coats. Um, but Theresienstadt was, it was um, sort of, I think the Nazis tried to make it the model camp, and I believe the Red Cross, the Red Cross did come to, to visit the camp, and they cleaned up the camp as, uh, to make it look like it was just a, a friendly little Jewish neighborhood, and it's perfectly safe, and there's nothing wrong here. Um, and this is a cleaner ghetto. Uh, uh, for the people of the of the Red Cross, and this it says all of the sidewalks will be scrubbed. And I I enjoy the irony of this. They're cleaning up for the Red Cross, but in the process, by scrubbing the sidewalks and leaving water all over the place, this poor blind guy is probably going to slip and fall in the water and get desperately injured. You know, he's always finding just how silly this ex or the absurd this existence is in this camp and all of the contradictions that exist. This is the, uh, the Speise Hall, or the dining hall in the barracks uh, that they built. I think they built a kind of a fake dining hall because they're, you know, they barely had nothing, they had barely anything to eat. There was no dining hall at the, at the barracks on a regular basis, but they built one for the Red Cross. Um, this is the dentist office that was created for the Red Cross that didn't exist. And this one has, it says, you know, everything will be beautified and decorated, and the sign in the window has the menacing message of Halte den Mund und deine Sahne gesund, which means keep your mouth shut and you'll have health uh, for your healthy teeth, which I find very threatening. Basically, don't rat on us or we'll bust your teeth out. Um, and of course, the irony is also that there's dental hygiene products on that sign, which were never afforded to any of the people in the camp. Um, People did find a way to get cigarettes, though, uh, and these were, these were, I understand, the most precious commodity inside the camp. Um, I think one of the signs said people, like starving people would basically f like p give their last loaf of bread for, for, a, for a pack of cigarettes, or a, for a single cigarette. And so this is Let Me Smoke a Bit. And this is interesting, this piece, uh, because it's the only piece that I'd seen that it was actually written in Czech and not German. And I'm not sure why that is, per se. Uh, but I thought that was an interesting point. I also like, he's got this thing where he has these heads and these hands that are sort of discombobulated, and I really love the way he does that. Um, of course, we all know that smoking is bad for you. I've drawn cartoons using smoking as a metaphor for how bad it is. This is about um, America's dependence on coal power and fossil fuel and Uncle Sam hacking, saying, hell schmelf, I'll quit when I'm ready. Cough, cough. Um, uh, smoking appears various places in the, in the work. This was a story that I, I think I read this story about this image in particular where a, uh, a ghetto guard who is an inmate but also tasked with guarding the facility, these people often weren't beloved by the other inmates, uh, had, had procured some cigarettes and was holding them underneath his hat and then we walked past a member of the SS was obliged to salute him and the cigarettes fell out of his hat and for for hiding the cigarettes, his punishment was deportation to the east, the next transport to the east. Um, and so here's, a, here's an image where he's, he's talking about something that apparently he saw um, in the camp. And there's a couple of images that feature the police and guards in the camp. Some of them are sympathetic, some of them are not. This is the arrival of uh, the Jewish police from, the, um, from Westerbork. And, and their arrival to camp. I'm, I'm not sure he's particularly sympathetic to their arrival. Uh, he was, he does have a couple images that are sympathetic of the Czech guards that were uh, in charge of the camp. Uh, it was in Czechoslovakia and there was a, a, a population of Czech people around the camp area and there were several guards who were, who were not members of the SS or, or, or members of the, get, or in the ghetto who were there guarding. Uh, apparently, I read that at some point there were about 150 guards at any time, and they were often rotated out because they didn't want them to develop too many too strong relationships with the inmates there. But here is a, uh, a friendly guard who throws a, a, cigarette, a, a, a big cigarette butt uh, in front of the inmates. 
And that was the idea of kindness, was, was throwing a, a healthy cigarette butt. Smoking was very important to these people. Um, and then uh, here is an image of uh, a ghetto guard stuck on the ramparts. Uh, it says, protection from, or, protection from deportation to Poland is not a free gift, uh, explaining how much, you know, you, you know, I think it's very sympathetic to this character, this ghetto guard, who generally these were reviled figures because they were seen as traitors and, and collaborators with the Nazis, uh, these ghetto guards. Um, but oftentimes they were, you know, they just wanted what was best for their family to avoid getting deported. And I, I think it's interesting how he sort of, despite the fact that we consider these reviled figures from a historical perspective, I think he's showing some sympathy for this person right here, which I think is interesting and compelling. Um, and I've used this sort of imagery in cartoons myself quite a bit. Uh, this was a Game of Thrones reference. Uh, winter is coming. Actually, this is pretty normal for April in Wisconsin. I do a lot of cartoons about winter in Wisconsin, apparently. <laughs> It's like my favorite. Um, here is just a fabulous image. I, I'm such a fan of the way he just draws the heads and the hands of people to imply how overcrowded it is. There's not even enough space to get the whole body into the image. Um, you know, and so this is not enough water for so many ghetto inmates. And I can just imagine these, like, what, six guys trying to shower on a little drip, drip, drip of water. Um, and I like the discombobulated heads. I want to try and do that more in my work. I did this cartoon, which sort of is like those, those heads that are just sort of floating around. This was a Robin Williams obituary cartoon from 2014, which almost captures that, but not quite as good as Leslie would do it, I don't think. Um, he's got this one, which I think is really compelling. This is the lunch break. Um, and it's, it's all of these women hovering around the stove, cooking their lunch. Um, and again, it's just the heads and the hands, and they're very expressive. But what's also really telling about this is the care he's gone in to draw the hairstyles and, and, and implying how hard people worked to stay, you know, to keep their hair done and, and all that effort that was done in the camps to, to, to sort of maintain that normalcy as best as you can. And of course, when I see a, a big pile of, of things on a stove, I think back of one of my cartoons about uh, how climate change is always on the back burner in our society. Um, and while we get distracted by all the other things in the front, like a ban on gas stoves and whatnot. So um, I, I, we're finding some of the same inspiration in things. Uh, and then one of the things that I found just fascinating when you're talking about the hierarchy and the society of the camps was the the, how important cooks were and how they were on the highest level of society in the camps. And so this says, because the doctors are also hungry, a cook is always prioritized. So um, we, we see here a doctor and, and the cook has the potatoes behind him and he's getting, he's getting special treatment because he's got the, the food. Um, and so everyone was always hungry in the camps. Um, and look at the depictions of the doctor and the cook. These are not sympathetic characters uh, that he's drawing here. Um, in fact, they sort of some ugly stereotypes involved in the, in the artwork. Um, and then, of course, I've, I've disparaged doctors myself. In the past, I did this cartoon when uh, Republicans were trying to thwart our mask mandate in uh, Wisconsin, which dur during the height of COVID, and Republicans saying, our esteemed panel of physicians agrees that we don't need a mask mandate. And we have Dr. Lecter, Dr. Evil, and Dr. Nick from The Simpsons. Hi, everybody. Uh, and but and everything's always funnier in threes. So cartoonists know this that everything's funnier in threes, and Leslie knew that too. And here is his biting uh, uh, cartoon of the three kings of the ghetto, the three cooks. Um, I, again, not the most flattering depiction of these people. Um, I thought the work done in Theresienstadt itself was worth showing, and just how um, uh, you know he, he doesn't seem to have a lot of. I think he's. Uh, rather disdainful of these cooks because of the power that they wield in the ghetto. And then this is the cook and the cleaner, sort of the power couple of the ghetto, <laughs> uh, because they had the, they had the highest privilege, uh, the highlight of the party in the ghetto. Yes, love goes through the stomach. Um, and I just want to take a minute to talk about uh, his depictions of Jewish people and, and his in his artwork. So I think nowadays we can look at this objectively and say there are a lot of sort of anti-Semitic tropes that he's playing into uh, with his artwork, um, which I think today we find offensive. But I think it's important to remember that he is just, you know, we're all products of the time we live in, and he was a product of his time. 
a lot of the way, things he's doing is I think were a lot of the ways J Jewish people were portrayed in the mainstream media, mainstream art, and I think he's falling into those same traps. We see that uh, you know in a similar way. You know, several years ago, Dr. Seuss came under fire. That, well, you know, Dr. Seuss uh, has done some work that was incredibly offensive to African Americans, incredibly offensive to Asian people. Um, and I think his company has stopped publishing a lot of those books. But I think Dr. Seuss also wrote probably the most important anti-racist book in the American canon, which is the Sneetches, which is you know about the the you know the absurdity of racism and directly referencing the stars which the which the Nazis made the Jews wear, and just what a silly thing all of our prejudices can be. Uh, when we're really all the same. And so I wouldn't want to cancel Dr. Seuss's work because of some of his questionable depictions of people from uh, a time when that's the way everyone is just displaying them uh, because he has done some amazing work. And I think Leslie is exactly the same way. He has done some amazing work that gives us an amazing insight into the experience inside a, a Jewish ghetto. Um, and so we can't discount it just because um, there are some kind of ugly images in it. Um, and then this image, I think, is just fascinating. This is baptized Jews are coming, clothes make the people, the stars make the Jews. This is a reference to the, the law in, in Germany that, that, you know, if you were, if, even if you were, a, you know, if your grandparents were Jewish, even if you were a practicing Catholic or, 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 even, or Lutheran, you know, you were still considered Jew. It was, it was deeper than faith, it was, it was heritage. And the way that uh, the, the, the way he's and this is this is such a political cartoon, you know. You, you basically the way the Nazis have taken away the humanity of the people and replaced them with just the star, and that's all that matters to them. Um, th no matter how you were raised, what clothes you wear, what your faith is, the star is all that defines you. I think is um, really telling, and and just a powerful political cartoon. Um, you know, he, he did a lot of work that was very sympathetic to people, too. It's not all nasty depictions. This, you know, and it's, it's weird to think of a camp where this, this young woman is, has to smuggle in flowers from the field. You know, like smuggling in, for, this is a farm worker smuggles in forbidden flowers because who, who bans flowers? I mean, this, <laughs> these are monsters, you know, and I think that he's pointing out just how absurd that situation is. Um, He's got these nice quiet moments of art that he does. This is Silent Night in the Hanover Barracks. I think this was the barrack he was actually in. This is, I think this is sort of a narrative depiction of, of, of camp life. You can see how closely stacked those bunk beds are, though. I mean, that's right on top of each other. I think there's three or four bunks there. Um, just, uh, just horrid conditions. And, and I, I like that they're playing chess in the corner, which reminds me of, of one of my favorite editorial cartoons that I've ever dr drawn about playing chess. They say that Vladimir Putin and Barack Obama weren't playing the same game. Like Putin was playing chess and Obama was playing checkers. And so I sort of imagined what the foreign policy game would be like. So this is Obama saying, king me, Putin saying, checkmate, and Donald Trump yelling, scissors. Uh, so that's playing the foreign policy game. And that, you know, but there was a time when Putin was just sort of a goofy oddball, and, and now he's a, mo I mean, he's a monster. Um, and I think Lesky would approve of a cartoon like this that takes a turn of phrase and twists it around. Because um, there's a saying, you know, when you, when you find yourself in a hole, the first thing you do is you stop digging. And my, this cartoon about Putin is when you find yourself in a hole, don't stop digging, turn it into a mass grave. Um, so. I think we're, we're in a time where we're seeing these sort of atrocities, uh, again, on a much smaller scale, but still um, disturbing. I liked this image, even though I find it, I find this image actually bizarrely flat compared to the rest of Leslie's work. Um, everything he's done is so vibrant, and this one just seems like maybe he was in a hurry, or maybe, he, maybe it was something he wasn't so passionate about, but I do love the message behind it and the sort of catch-22 situation he's pointing out, which is, in the ghetto, your free time activity is work. Everything else is your free time, you know? So anything you want to do in your free time is fine, as long as it's work. Um, apparently, yeah, so 
And then this image is uh, extra portions for the hard laborers. And you can see how, how giant that extra portion is right there, too. Um, that's just an editorial cartoon. That's, I've, I've done cartoons that are very similar to that, where you point out how absurd it is to, to call that an extra portion and how small that, that extra portion is. Um, and then another thing that cartoonists do all the time is, is we're always uh, pointing out how things that seem the same are different. Uh, and this is, the, and Lesky's actually written it out clearly, when two in the ghetto do the same thing, it isn't always the same. This one smuggles, um, he's, this one's smuggling over here, and this one's stealing from an old person. And so, so getting food illegally isn't the same. Well, it's okay to go grab it from the storehouse, but don't go steal it from the old sick people. Um, and, and sort of that's an apples and oranges situation. And I've done that precise thing in some of my cartoons, like with you know, the document scandal between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. It was literally apples and oranges. I have Joe Biden, it's apples. Oops, I didn't know I had these with Donald Trump, the orange, saying they're mine, you can't have them. Um, and so cartoonists are always comparing and contrasting and finding those differences. And it's so silly that something as, as simple as apples could lead to deportation to the East and the Theresienstadt camp. Um, this, was, this is called risky apple stealing, and of course the penalty is uh, next transport to the East. He has a recurring theme the, where you see in his images where he says, the penalty is uh, deportation to the East. And I find this image um, interesting. I really like the way the train goes through his head and sort of implies that that was always in the back of your mind, always going through your mind, this train, you know, you don't want to be on the next train East. Uh, and that was always a threat and a, and a constant threat to these people who were already living in such horrible situations. Um, but I think one of the things that I really like about Leslie's work is just how much he shows what everyday life was. We take this 30,000 foot view of the Holocaust and we just sort of say it was, everything was horrible and it was, and it was horrible. But there, there, are, there are quiet moments of humanity here and, and these are, um, and it's all complex. These are people gathering boards for their kumbals. A kumbal, maybe you saw that inside of the exhibit, but they were people, like people would try and scope out and sneak out to get the, uh, the top rafters of the bunk, and they would slap together some boards to have just a hint of privacy. And where do they get the boards? Well, you know, sometimes the Czech guards just wouldn't watch the pile too closely, and you'd go g gather your boards and put together your kumbal, um, and they'd look the other way. And then here's uh, every man's dream to be alone in his kumbal. Uh, and this, I don't know if he's being, I don't know if he's necessarily being sympathetic to the person in the kumbal or if he's jealous, but I think everyone's dream was to have a little bit of privacy and a little bit of space to themselves. And the one thing I need to point out too, it seems like it's always snowing in Theresienstadt in his, in his Israeli drawings. And maybe that's because it was often cold and dark and horrible there. Maybe everything feels cold and heart, dark and horrible after you're in a beautiful place like Israel for so long. Um, but I do find that, uh, that, that it's always snowing is interesting. And then I, I just love this image. Uh, this is uh, a night alone with her uh, in the in the kumbal, and it says off Bar Palanda, which I think is just sort of a, a funny name. But so so in in these constant in these camps, there was there was horror, there was starvation, but there was also kindness, and there was a little bit of joy, and even apparently a little bit of sex. You know, so um, I, I think learning about this history and the complexity that occurred in these camps is just something we need to focus on because we're, we're, losing everyone, we're losing the people who remember this firsthand. I did this cartoon a couple years ago about, it was on an anniversary of D-Day and it's this kid saying, great grandpa, tell me again about the day you saved the world. Um, and, and we're losing our World War II veterans, we're losing people that experienced life in the camps. Um, and we can't forget this horrible part of our history lest we repeat it. And, and we're seeing that. We're seeing uh, a rise in anti-Semitic hate across the country. We had swastikas painted on a monument in, in Madison, Wisconsin recently, and I did this cartoon with the veteran yelling cowards at them. Um, you know, the democratic rule of law has been questioned. You know, we had people ransack our Capitol building because they were upset about the results of election and tried to overthrow it. And this is the cleanup of after January 6th and the, the janitor saying, so this is making America great again. 
Um, and then we have people that like, would like us to forget that. I've done this cartoon, which was December 7th, 1941. Never, for, never forget, December 7th, 1941, September 11th, 2001. And then on January 6th, nothing, in, uh, nothing of consequence happened on this day. Um, and so we have to remember these things so we don't repeat them. Um, like what's going on in Ukraine right now. You know, we have a, a, a dictator who is starting a land war and, you know, we've had 70 years of peace in Europe until Putin, you know, drove his tanks into Ukraine. Um, and he's a, you know, diabolical strong man. And, and thankfully, there are strong men willing to stand up to him, like Vladimir Zelensky, a strong Jewish president of Ukraine. Uh, so we have the strong man versus the strong man. Um, and I, I just want to say we need to, this is the last slide I'll leave you guys with. Uh, this is uh, Eric Lichtbaileski's, this is the dream, uh, or, or maybe a mirage. It's, it's the dream of, of moving to the, the Holy Lands. And, you know, thankfully for Leslie, his dream came true. He moved to Israel and lived out a life of peace. But for far too many, it was just a mirage. Um, and, and the horrors of the Holocaust took way too many lives. Um, and so uh, that is my slide presentation. And I'd like to thank you guys all for coming. Uh, this, no, this was done in Israel. This was done after. But, I, I, but various parts of it were done in the camp. Like there is this, this, uh, this figure was, uh, is, was done in the, in the camp. And uh, thank you, Phil. I really appreciate it. I had this idea that I was going to start off with an easy question for you, Phil, but I'm actually going to start you with one of my hard questions. You don't have hard questions. There's no hard questions, only hard answers. <laughs> when, there we where go. do you draw a line between what you're willing to address in this medium and what you're not? Oh, you're going right to it? Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'd like to say in a perfect world, um, you know, we don't, you know, cartoonists, we don't make fun of, of, the, of the mentally handicapped. We don't make fun of handicapped people. We don't make fun of racial minorities for being, you know, racial minorities. We don't make fun of people because of their ethnicity. Um, but the, the world is getting more complicated. Uh, you know, we have, a, we have a, the mayor of Madison is a woman. Her name is Satya Rhodes Conway, a very brilliant woman. Um, and, and she's, but she's, she's not super skinny. Um, and when I've drawn her in my cartoons, I've tried to draw her as accurately as possible. No matter what I do, people attack me for saying, you're drawing the mayor too fat. You would never draw a man like that, which is not true. I draw men as fat as I can. You saw my drawing of Trump, you know. Um, and, and so I, I find myself sort of pulling back sometimes because, you know, the question is whether the Jews is worth the squeeze, you know. Like, is it worth getting people fired up for the wrong reasons if, you're not, if they're not going to catch your point? And people are really into getting fired up for the wrong reasons nowadays and not seeing the deeper moment, meaning of an editorial cartoon that you're trying to make. So I'll do a cartoon criticizing the mayor's policy, and somebody says, you're just doing that because she's a woman. And, and that's, I feel like that's unfair to her because she's, you know, she's brilliant and she's got her own ideas, and, but she can't be above, above reproach just because she is a woman. You know? And I, I feel like we're, we're dangerously going into an area where we're saying, we can't criticize people because of who they are. What, not, I, I, I only criticize people for what they do. I never criticize people for who they are. But I, I worry we're conflating the two things nowadays. So then how do you choose your subject matter? When you're, you, you mentioned that you might just look out the window and you draw the guy in the shorts and the sandals. And that literally cool. happens. Yes, that happens. Um, but unlike, so, so, <laughs> so um, one of my jobs at the newspaper is I get to edit every single letter to the editor that comes in to the, from the community, which gives me a really interesting window on what my audience at the newspaper is thinking about, what they're fired up about. And when I'm thinking of a cartoon to draw, which I think makes me very different from Leslie, is that when I'm thinking of a cartoon to draw, I'm drawing it for my audience. Like, that's who it's for. It's not, it's, I mean, it's, it's me in there, but I'm trying to direct it at them. What do they want to see? What do they need to see? What do, how do I challenge them to change their, their, their points of views or perspectives? I think Leslie, a lot of what he was doing was just creating work for himself to keep himself sane in this harsh situation. I mean, the, the, the exhibit is called To Paint to Live. I mean, like, it's, for him, it was a therapy and a way to process a crazy time in his life. But for me, it's all about 
my audience? What do they need to hear? And what do you want from your audience? Do you have a goal in mind? Adoration? No. Um, <laughs> um, I, want, uh, I want them to think more, and I want, them to ch I want, to, I want to challenge pe preconceived notions. I want people to, to think about their, their values and, and challenge them. I, I mean, I think a value that's unchallenged is a very weak value. I mean, if, if somebody's not, not telling you to question what you believe, if you, don't, if you don't question what you believe, how strong are your beliefs? You know? And so I want to challenge people and, and, and give them something to think about. Um, sometimes I just want to fire up people, though. I mean, sometimes I just want to get the, you know, Madison is a very progressive town, and sometimes I just want to get the progressives like, yeah, the, you know, you know Trump's a, a dummy, you know, and sometimes that's as simple as it is. But a lot of times it's really about making them question their progressive values that don't often get very questioned, you know. I think we have some opportunities for people in the audience to ask questions uh, over here on the left. What, what do we know about Lutsky when, uh, after he got out of the camp and was in Israel? How did his artwork change, or did it? I, I'm not a, a historical expert on him. My understanding was that he was a house painter in Israel, right? Yeah. That's right, yeah. So he, he managed to, to make it to Israel, and he did not really have a lot of what you would call conser, co, you know, uh, commercial success. He worked as a house painter and used watercolors to recreate the pieces that he began when he was in Treasonstadt. And it was near the end of his life as well that he did this. He began, you know, a lot of the reproductions that you see in there that were made by him were done in the 80s. I mean, uh, I, can you blame him? I mean, would you want to go, I mean, like, it's just all that trauma that you got to bring up again as you, as you go through that old work and then to recreate it right after you've just experienced it. But I can see as a way of cathartically reproducing it as a way to process it as you get older is definitely a, something that I could see doing, but I don't blame him for not wanting to deal with it right away. Sometimes you just got to push on through. Hey folks, we've got two people with microphones in the auditorium. If you have a question, please keep your hand up until someone gets to you. Thank you. Uh, Lesky had to self-center, excuse me, uh, self-center censor, excuse me, his work, which is why he hid it in the camps. What about yourself? Do you find that you'd love to draw something now that 20 years ago you wouldn't have hesitated at all, but now, because of the political climate, you don't do it? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think with, uh, you know, and, and a lot of it has to do, you know, like, so a, a part of it is that there's a lot more diversity. It was easy back in the day. All the people in power were old white men, and it's easy to make fun of old white men. People all don't, you know, no, no, you know, it's 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 just easy. Um, they're fun to caricature. Nobody cares if they don't look, you know, look, you know, well. But you know, if I draw a cartoon about the superintendent of schools in Madison, if I'm critical of his policies, people accuse me of being racist because he's a black man. You know, so it's it, the world does get more. The world is more complicated, and that's good. It's good that we have people in power. Of a, of a much more diverse background. Um, and and I, uh, there's, there is something to sort of be said, like I, I, I get the perspective that like white men ruled the earth for like 2,000, 3,000 years, you know, and, and, and now that as soon as, you know, a woman's in charge, you're gonna make fun of her, like give her a break. I, I sort of get where that's coming from, but I do, I try to go after ideas. You know, that's really, I, I, wanna, I wanna be critical of ideas I don't like. And sometimes those ideas come from complicated places. Um, but yes, there is, there is a lot of self-censorship that goes on nowadays, unfortunately. Have you ever drawn a sympathetic cartoon of Trump? I did once, yeah. <laughs> I did. Uh, when he was, I, I can't, I, I mean, it, I, I probably have it on my laptop somewhere here, but uh, I did a cartoon. It wasn't, I mean, it had... He was talking with um, the leader of North Korea, and there was this moment where there was like, could they come up with some sort of deal? And I did a, I did a piece of coming out of a nuclear missile, you know? And so I thought that was actually, I mean, it was, he was doing something, and maybe it didn't always work, but I, he was doing something to try and, I was sympathetic to that. I appreciated that effort to try and create peace with North Korea. So yes, I have done a sympathetic cartoon of Trump. Not many. 
I've done a lot of sympathy cartoons to a lot of Republicans. I mean, I, I, I am not a Democrat. Uh, I, am, I, am, I, I consider myself a fierce moderate. Um, and so uh, the, the thing is that moderation is always moving around, you know. <laughs> You said Lesky was not a sanctioned artist, so how and where did he get his supplies to do all that work in the camp? I don't, I don't know. I mean, do you know where he got his work? Not I mean, specifically. So what we know about the camp itself is that as, as it was used as almost a form of propaganda, as a place that the Germans or the Nazis would bring the International Red Cross to show off and say, look how nice it is here. We have artists, we have writers, we have musicians, there's a symphony orchestra. It's like a spa. It's a spa. Um, and so that, you know, we, we understand through that that there might have been opportunities for them to get materials that they needed to create things that they could then maybe turn around and show off and were available. But we don't know specifically how Leslie got his. But I'm glad he did. Have you come up with a caricature of DeSantis? <laughs> Sort of goofy look. I mean, not a good one. I've done a couple drawings of him, but I haven't, I haven't nailed him quite yet. I look to the cartoonists in Florida to, to really see what they're doing. There's a couple of people that are, that are nailing him on a pretty consistent basis. One of the biggest honors of my life was, uh, so in, I, I spent, I'm in Wisconsin. You guys might remember a governor there called Scott Walker who ran for president. Um, I, I did a lot of, I, I, I owned Scott Walker in terms of drawing cartoons about him. And one of my favorite cartoonists told me once, is like, I never figured out how to draw Scott Walker until I saw you do it. So it oftentimes it goes to the people who are right there on the ground with him. And there are people who have been drawn DeSantis for, for forever. So I'm looking at them and I'm working on it. It's on my to-do list. We have time for two more questions. Just two more? Yeah. Jeez. Oh, Ask away now. Okay, my turn. Um, I, the, there's such immense power in the original drawings that he did um, in Theresienstadt. What is the compulsion for recreating those? The compulsion for recreating them? I, I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, because I'm not him. But I, I, I would think it would be to, to share the original message, because a lot of, I mean, in, in most cases, the, the, art, the words were taken off of them. And so they weren't as powerful without the words that went in. The, I mean, he has these images that are, as I say, sort of innocuous, maybe even a little bit goofy. And then you add these words of like, meet you in the death camp, or in the mass grave. You know, that adds that twist of the, of the needle to that, to that work. And I think he wanted people to see that. And probably the catharsis of processing his memories again, too. Yeah, I think it's worth noting that you know, a lot of the originals, the smaller format ones that were made in the camps, when you go and look in the exhibit, he cut the captions off of them. And the reason he did that is that while he was in the camp, there was a crackdown on art artists that the Nazis deemed to be too critical of what they were going through. And so uh, I believe that part of it was to recreate them in their fullness and to get the message that he had to remove from the original pieces off, which he removed for, uh, for self-preservation. Could you put the artwork on a timeline? And if so, was there an evolution of his mental state? I, I, I'm not, I'm, was there a timeline in the gallery? Is that chronological? Not specifically. So, so that's a really interesting question. And I, I would say that I don't notice one myself, although I'm maybe not the right person to ask, uh, you know, to analyze the technique or the, the approach to the art. But it all, for me, it looks very, very consistent, with the exception of the one that you mentioned that looked a little more flat and a little more hurried. Um, and certainly, one of the things that stands out to me is that when he reapproached them again in the 1980s, they look almost one-to-one, -one, like he really recreated them so authentically and so close to the originals. But that's about the most that I can attest to anything along those lines. I mean, I'm thinking that the one that was his first night in the camp was probably drawn pretty early, and there is a lot of detail in that. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if he was sort of, you know, as you're, you're malnourished. And I, I, would, I would assume that the style would sort of deteriorate a little bit over the time period, um, yeah. just because it does for me. If I haven't had enough to sleep, I don't draw as well. Right, so they're all roughly around the same year for creation, but I don't know which order for exactly. I, they are, uh, the exhibit is 
kind of in numerical order for how they were numbered by the Holocaust Museum LA, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were they kept in the, cre the order they were created in, so. Well, Phil, thank you so much for this oh, discussion. Glad I could be here. This was this and, worked out great. Uh, I'm not drawing you though, Mark, right? That was the, that was the No, that, you cannot draw me. Okay, I can't draw you, okay. <laughs> and thank you everyone for being with us today. Uh, if you liked what you learned, uh, we hope you'll support our work by becoming a member for the Zuckerman Holocaust Center and joining us for future programs and events. Uh, it's an exciting time at the center. Uh, at the end of May, our core exhibit will undergo a complete renovation to meet the experiential needs of the 20th century, 21st century visitor while staying true to our mission, vision, and values. You'll see some renderings uh, as you walk out of the uh, room here. The center will remain open during this time, and we welcome you to join us for special programs and events. And you can find out more about those events at holocaustcenter.org. And we now invite you to join us for a dessert reception where we'll keep the conversation going. Phil will be happy to answer more of your questions. And thank you all, and have a great afternoon. All of your questions.